Thank you, and thanks for coming. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm with Big Huge Games. We're a, whoop, yeah, there we are. Uh, we're a developer based in Baltimore, Maryland. The founders of the studio, though, have been working together in one form or another for about 20 years. So it's very, you know, very tight group that has a very common philosophy related to games. Uh, in about, about three years ago, we released our first game on mobile called Dominations. Um, fortunately, it was a very successful game. It also happened to be their first game on mobile. So there's some repercussions for that that I'll be talking about as we talk about production reliability. Um, one of our core values, as you can see as part of a studio, is that we believe great games take a lot of time and a lot of iteration. Um, and that iteration philosophy also applies to like how we approach uh, improving production. So one of the values of that we have as a studio, core value is make new mistakes. Um, and a corollary to that means that in order to make new mistakes, you have to stop making old mistakes. Um, you know, old mistakes are when you keep doing something over and over again, and it's not working for you, but you keep doing it. So we want to discourage people from doing that. We want to make sure that they're thinking about how can I actually iterate on this process? How can I improve it? Um, another reason why that's really important to us is it says that um, may, being able to identify something that's wrong um, and, it, and saying I want to take a really critical look at this is not punitive. What you really want to discourage is having people on your team thinking that if they say something's wrong or that something's happened, um, that it's better for them to bury the body than to say, hey, there's something happening here. Because any of you who watch zombie movies know that burying bodies usually comes back to get you. <laughs> so one of the things that I want to talk about is how we took a look over this year at, at breaking the cycle of some of the old mistakes and basically getting on that healthier pathway to saying, like, how can we do things better? Which may mean looking at um, new ways to make new mistakes. So what does that mean to us? What that means is like you first take that very honest, critical look at what are your pain points? Um, what are the kinds of things that you think you might need to do to try to change? Um, how are you actually going to measure it? Like how can you figure out what is the impact of the change that you want to make? And then try it and be willing to try again. Because the other thing, again, going back to that iteration philosophy is you have to be willing to admit that the first time you try something, it may not work exactly as you think. And you have to keep taking that critical look, looking at your measurements, and trying again. So one of the first problems that we took a look at was we had an extremely unreliable release cadence. And this actually ties back to the fact that this was the first mobile game that the studio had done. The team that released it had really deep experience on console and PC and didn't have very deep experience on mobile. And being very honest and looking at our mistakes, that meant that we made a lot of decisions that had a pretty serious impact on our uh, overall game reliability and performance. So a lot of the first year was spent firefighting um, and just making sure that the game itself was you know, on, live and operating. What that meant, though, is that we weren't really looking as a studio at like how could we get better and what was the impact of having some of this you know, unreliable cadence. It also meant that people got into some, um, I would say, unfortunate habits um, about how we were developing our releases. So you might want to think about like what, why would we care if the cadence though was unreliable? Like what difference did this make? So some of the problem is that when you have something that's unreliable as this, you're not training your players to start looking forward to like when your release is coming out. So they don't know, especially your, your players who've made a commitment to you, they don't know when they're going to be getting a new feature or new, you know, something new to play with or something interesting to happen. It also means that it becomes extremely hard to start planning your live ops process because you don't know when that feature is coming out or that sale may actually be available. It's also very hard to make a commitment to get featuring. And featuring, obviously, is a very important path for us for user acquisition. One of the things that contributed to this unreliability was we had a fairly long development cycle. It set a cycle that was um, eight weeks. And people would be working on things for eight weeks, which sounds great, doesn't it? If you're a developer, I get to work on this for eight weeks, yay. Um, until everybody merged in and things exploded because you had lots of merge conflicts. So all of a sudden, 
all of your timing in terms of how long was it going to take to test this um, went out the window. So what this started looking like, you can see, days between releases starts looking really ugly. And in fact, that trend line is going in exactly the opposite direction. So 45 days between releases in and of itself doesn't sound so bad, except when you start looking at the deviation. So it could have been as much as 83 days between a release or 22 days between a release. So again, how do we get to that predictability? So what we did was um, go back to basics with the team and said, this is what we want the cycle to look like. We want to start with a kickoff. We want everyone to know, why are we building this release? What is, what is important in this release? Because you want everyone thinking about it so that they can actually start you know, helping set the priorities. They understand what's important to you. You also want to make sure that you know, spec review, arc review, QA, what that really means is what are we going to build? How are we going to build it? How are we going to test it? Do we know that? And once you know those things, then you can say, OK, now we're ready to go. And everything else just looks so easy. Yeah, sprint, feature complete, submission, yay. Um, but the other thing we had to do is say, how much time do we want to spend on this? We want to get to a very reliable cadence. How much time do we actually think that this is going to take so that we can actually start predicting? Um, and so again, this is what we decided. If you were going to do something like this, you decide what works for your team. But we said, how much time are we giving for each one of these you know, key pieces and key milestones within a release? So set all this up, and what happens? You can see the first release, 56 days, yay, not too bad. Second one, we were still a little sloppy. We got very arrogant. We had one good release. People kind of forgot. Had to go back in, do a little more tweaking, remind everyone. We had to make some improvements to the process. Had to make sure that, like, you know, did we really understand um, how to do some estimation? Did we understand, like, you know, what an arch architecture review meant? Um, but overall, and you can see over the course of the year, that starts flattening out really nicely. In fact, being a little bit of an you know, operations person, what thrills me is I see 263s up there. <laughs> like, yes, consistency, hooray. Um, so the other thing is, even though it looks like the average days between releases is a little longer, the deviation between them is much, much smaller. Cut that in half. So. That was a great one. Very happy about that. So our next big mistake was our releases were very buggy. Um, and that, again, goes back to some of those other problems that I mentioned. When you have people and they're all checking in at the same time, you're eating into your QA time, you've got a lot of issues, you've got things that you can't predict. Um, one of the things that was causing some of those weird release cadences was we didn't know how long it was going to take to test things. So people would work on something, and then you'd suddenly find out, oh, it was going to take another eight weeks to test it. And oh, that's no good. Well, we'll pull it out of the release. And then people would get very frustrated, and it would cause other problems. So how do we fix the, you know, the fact that we wanted to get away from having buggy releases? So one of the way, things that we decided was you're going to measure that by actually looking at our customer, uh, customer service tickets. Because what I really care about, what the team really cares about, is not like you know what's sort of what is not seen, but what is the player-facing impact of those bugs. So that doesn't look too great. We started breaking it out and saying, okay, well, what does this actually mean? What are we actually doing? And you can start seeing where we have some peaks and valleys. So we started digging into each one of these. So we'll take a look at this first one, this thing that we called vault capacity. This was something that seemed so trivial when it came up in, ten, in, in, the, in development. Because this was something that had been released months ago. And it just so happened that one of the testers noticed that the behavior didn't actually line up with the design documents. So the tester very properly wrote up a bug, assigned it to a developer. The developer fixed it. We released it. And all of our players freaked out, because all of a sudden, it's not behaving the way they thought it should be behaving. So what we did was we had to look at a process adjustment and say, once something is live and it doesn't match the design documentation, you have to make a decision. You can't just sort of say automatically fix it. What we're going to do, what we've, what we've started doing, is 
that now has to go to someone in design, and there has to be a discussion. What's the impact of the way that it's actually behaving in the life service? And either say, the design documentation is now wrong, and fix it. That's a nice easy one, because all you have to do is change the documentation. Or you're making a change, you now have to actually socialize that to your players the way that you, you socialize anything that you're going to change. And doing that has actually helped us a few times when we've had other situations similar to this that have come up. So rather than them going out and driving customer service tickets, we fix them internally first. So the next big issue I want to take a look at is this thing that's circled that's called chat. So when you have a game that has a large social mechanic, chat's really important. People need to talk to each other. And we felt we didn't have a great chat system. So one of the things that we had assigned to somebody was to re-architect and rebuild part of the chat system, which sounds like a great idea. Except that what we discovered, unfortunately, was that we actually didn't have a really good way of testing infrastructure. So we thought we were testing it. We thought we had enough time. And what happened was, we rolled that out, chat blew up, lots of player complaints. So what we had to do is say, you know what? We need to make sure that we actually pay attention to how we test our back end with the same care that we use when we're actually testing a game feature. So the rule now is that, you know, first of all, we need to make sure that is there a plan for testing? Do we have staff assigned to it? Do we actually know how we're going to test it? Do we know how we're actually rolling it out to players? And can we revert it? So one of the positives on that was, you know, result was that when we actually then did a release of our leaderboards, absolutely no player facing complaints. So again, doing a back end change ended up working well for players and not having any problems when we actually released it. Another thing I want to point out is you see that nice big spike at the end? This, this one kills me. This wasn't us. We had a database failure at AWS. So I just want to remind everyone, sometimes things go wrong and it's not you. you know, there's nothing the dev team could have done. That wasn't even between a release. We, you know, what we did was respond as quickly as possible, restore it from backup. But it was a good reminder to us that things happen that you can't always control. What you want to do is then take a look at, are we monitoring things as best as we can? Is there an improvement we can make here? How, you know, how, how could we more quickly have re you know, uh, uh, rolled back to you know, that database to get everybody restored and back online quickly? So another thing I want to talk about. Back at last December, we rolled out a feature for the Winter Festival. It was a gift box, basically. It was a loot box. And we thought this was going to be great, and it was very seasonally appropriate, and yay. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're a very stat-heavy game, and so when you do something like this, there are a lot of permutations that we could have had. More time, you know, would have been required to test it than QA actually had. So they did what seemed extremely reasonable at the time, which is they did a lot of spot checks. Unfortunately, there was one permutation that was a really, really nasty exploit. Um, and you might think, like, well, why did this matter to us? It's because we were actually working on a feature that we were planning on releasing in Q2 that was very dependent on loot box mechanics. So after this happened and we realized, like, okay, we actually can't just spot check something. We need to be able to actually test the whole thing. Um, I asked our QA manager to sit down and figure out what was it actually going to take to test this feature. So he did. I said, very stat-heavy game, lots and lots of permutations. And he calculated it, and then he calculated it again, and then he had someone else check his calculations. And he came to me, and he said, 30 million years. And we're like, OK, well, that's not going to fit Q2. <laughs> so we have a problem. What are we going to do? We, you know, we have a lot of revenue committed against this feature. So option number one, kill the feature. We can't release it without it being intensely buggy. We shouldn't do it. Not my favorite option, because we thought it was a really fun feature. And we, as I said, we had a lot of revenue committed against it. So option two was, what the heck? <laughs> Just do some spot checks and see what happens. 
And again, I wasn't crazy about that one because we'd already gotten bit and that felt like it was like, well, this, that feels like we're making an old mistake. So the third option was, was well, this is very number centric. Can we automate the testing? And that's what we decided to do. So we actually dedicated development resources and built um, automated testing for this feature that was called the museum. And as you can see, by doing the, automatic, the automated testing, we took that down from 30 million hours to 1,165 hours. Actually, 30 million years, I'm sorry. It's an even better improvement. Um, the result was that we were able to roll it out on time. We were, it was, it was, we were able to get a good revenue generating feature out in the game and had a corollary for us of also proving that investing in, auto, in tools automation was actually you know, very worthwhile for the company as a whole. We'd never actually really made that kind of investment before. So it was actually a really important decision that we were like, we're going to start putting people against this. So, is that moving? Yeah. So I want to take another look then, talking about like how do we start looking at things, what do we mean by wanting to do automation, um, and how is that you know, actually improving some things, um, especially as we start moving over to like, okay, we do, as you saw, a lot of revenue generating features. Um, so a year ago, a typical week in August was about seven sales. This is the same week this year. So 300% increase in the number of sales and the type of sales we're doing now are much more complicated because we're not showing every single player every single sale, partly because that would just be really bad practice. Um, so a single sale, though, may have a lot, of, a lot of conditions. If you're at this age of the game, show this option. If you're at this age of the game, show this package. So the sales themselves, are, we're not only doing more of them, we're also doing much more complex sales because we've improved and increased our targeting tools. So that meant that the testing requirements increased. Testing requirements increased. Um, they're more complex. So big question came up for us of how can we actually address maintaining quality in the sales that go live without necessarily having to have a, a huge increase in the time to test them or in the staff needed to test them. So we also looked then at what can we do to start automating our sales process, our sales testing process. So we built a sales testing tool. Um, the week in August a year ago, as I mentioned, probably would have taken about 10 hours, which doesn't seem too bad, but when you then say, okay, now you've had this increase, if we had that same tool a year ago, it would have taken us three hours. And you can see the number of sales that we ran in July, and the number of sales we ran in August, and we were still able to do this with one tester because they now had a lot more support from automation in terms of the way that they were testing. So that was one where we felt like, okay, we anticipated the increase in volume was going to start increasing bugs. How can we avoid making that mistake? But there's never like only a single thing, like a single vector that's affecting you. Increasing sales also meant that there were things that we could do that you could test for. There also were things where you still needed a human being to go in and look. This is a really good example of it. Because you can see that's, that's just messy. And when you have, again, that many things, you know, the sales tester tool at this point, unfortunately, is not intelligent enough to, you know, to catch that. That requires a human. So our first thought was, um, okay, maybe we need to sort of crank down the volume of sales. Maybe what we can do instead of doing that number of sales, we'll, make, we'll do them for a longer period of time. And that sounded really sensible. Um, but our first try actually resulted in less revenue. So we're like, okay, we, we don't like that solution. Um, and again, it's like just because we tried it doesn't mean that we're stuck and like, oh, this is the only option, either go out with bugs or go out with less revenue. Um, so again, you know, I'm sorry, here's the, yes, you can see, revenue softness. I don't like charts that say revenue softness. Um, so again, the question was, is what do we do about this? And we sat down and took another look and said, well, what were the things that were driving a lot of those errors? 
both in terms of the things that the sales tester was capable of, uh, of catching and the things that we needed a human to go in and catch. And we realized that we totally had outgrown the previous live ops tools. You know, things that people could use a year ago um, in order to say, like, you know, they, they could set up a week of, tw of uh, sales. Um, now we're so manual that we are just getting burned by basically, like, you know, cut and paste errors. So the solution there was we need a new tool. And again, we, you know, so the good thing was by proving out that QA testing tools actually helped with something like museum, we were able to get that team in place, start building a front end tool that took a lot of those manual operations out from the live ops team. So they could now do things much more quickly, but much more efficiently with a lot of error, you know, error catching built right in for them. So the result there is more sales that can be more complex, that are more targeted with fewer errors going out to the customer so that we're not driving customer service tickets. So this was way shorter than I thought. Um, so basic summary I want to just leave you guys with. You want to make sure that you're making new mistakes. You don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over. So if that starts happening, what do you need to do to break the cycle? Um, you want to give permission to your team to try something new. It, it's not a punitive process. You also want to make sure that you're focused on what's the outcome that I want. So when, some, when something goes wrong, it's not so much about I want to blame this person. It's like I want to understand how we can go in and fix this so that everybody's actually working on fix it, getting to a solution and not pointing fingers. Because pointing fingers wastes a lot of time. What we also want to look at is um, how, do you, how do you make sure that you're, everybody's always focused on how do, I, how do I improve this? How do I keep asking that question of how could this be better? What can I do now to make this whole process better, work better for me, for the team, for the company? So looking ahead, some of the things that we're now going to be taking a look at, the things that we now have as our, you know, kind of did our first layer of pain points. So what's, what's the second layer of pain points? Well, now that we have a reliable release cadence, what we'll be looking at over the next year is how do we speed that up? So can we get to a point where rather than you know, those eight weeks between, launch, you know, between releases, can we get to you know, seven weeks, six weeks, five weeks? Um, and we're taking a look at trying something like can we restructure the release cadence and the re restructure the team around it in order to speed that up without adding any errors into the process? Um, what can we do to improve our estimation so that we actually have a better idea of how long does it actually take to build things? Um, we want to continue, we're going to be continuing to look at what are the ways that we can invest in automation so that we're, we are putting the tools in the hand of the people who need them um, and maybe, you know, relieving them of things like the, some of the really boring work so that they can actually focus on the things that have a lot of value to the company. And finally, we're getting ready for saying that we're going to be releasing our second game, what are all the things that we need to do to apply all of these lessons to the next game that's coming out? So that they don't have to learn from these old mistakes, they can actually start getting on a pathway to creating interesting and new mistakes for us. So, that's it. Questions? One, Any two. questions? Hi. Um, I just had a question about sort of how far you'd push this automated testing. Like, presumably, you've got a certain level, but do you have things like you know you've got a bot that like clicks on the screen and goes through common actions, and like that just runs like every night, or like how far have you pushed it, and where do you think that's going? Because I think in my company we've got like it loads up the game, and if it crashes, it fails. But I think. Have you found there's a lot of value in building a bot that like does common actions? We, we haven't gotten quite to that, you know, being able to go to that level of sophistication. Um, I keep talking to the um, the software developer manager who's now responsible for the test team about like um, what it, what is my ideal? My ideal would be that we have um, you know from the automatic build system that they have you know basically a bot that can go in and run through like here are the 30 things that we need to do to make sure that this is a viable build. 
in that I would come in every morning and there's a little report waiting for me that says, you have a viable build or your build is dead for these reasons. We're not at that level yet. Um, the things that we focused on testing first, in part because we wanted to prove that testing, ad, doing this actually had value, um, were things that were very, like I said, very stats-centric, uh, very number-centric, so that you could write a lot of scripting around them. Um, because by proving out that kind of value to the company, we are also then able to go back in and say, we actually have a good reason for setting this up as a permanent team. So I'm hoping we'll get to that level, but we haven't actually grown them to that point yet. Okay, thanks very much. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk, Judith. Uh, could you please share how much uh, management uh, pressure did it take to uh, the team to approve uh, the new approach, to change the old one? Uh, how you dealt with the not my fault issue and the like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it surprisingly didn't take a huge amount of pressure. Um, I think because, you know, if you saw that this schedule of the year before, I think the team themselves were pretty frustrated. Um, because again, with that very unreliable cadence, um, that led to people, you know, crunching and just, you know, like when you can't predict when a build's coming out, it becomes very hard then to say like, you know, when you can take off or what you can do. So I think they were very much looking forward to like, how can we actually do this better? So the good news on that part was that it actually didn't take a lot of management pressure. Um, we did spend a lot of time talking to people before we rolled it out to make sure everyone understood why we were doing it. But, but the good news there was that I think people understood that by going to this, um, that one of the commitments that we were making to them and that it's, it's something that personally I feel very strongly about. I'm extremely anti-crunch. Um, and so, you know, I think people understood that we were doing this because we were really trying to get to a point where we could have, like, you know, a reasonable amount of work and a reasonable amount of time. Um, the not my fault issue is a little harder because that's, um, you know, it's, it's very easy for me to stand up here and say, don't be punitive. Um, it, you know, it, you have to kind of keep showing that over and over. Um, and so learning how to do a good retrospective, learning how to do a good postmortem, um, you know, having somebody who's uh, viewed as being neutral, who's maybe managing the postmortem, can really help. Uh, one of the and setting some rules, like one of the rules that we've set is, the postmortem is where you talk about a process change. It's not where you talk about people failures. So in that public setting, that's not where you start saying, well, this would have been great if so and so hadn't done X. That that's that's inappropriate. Um, and so we'll we'll remind people about that right at the beginning. Um, this is about, is there a, uh, one of the things that, that our CEO will say a lot, is this a failure of process or a failure to have a process? And that, that's really what we focus on there. Um, if it's something where it does appear that it is a personnel issue, like that gets handled, um, you know, with a manager or in a one-on-one. -on -one. And if you have a situation where somebody's saying like, well, this went wrong and I, I'm not responsible, you know, that really sort of starts falling into the realm of like, okay, how do you start doing some mentoring and some counseling for that person so that they understand that actually, yeah, maybe they actually have to own that. Thank you very much. Uh, I, <clears throat> hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, your environments and your content authoring. Can mm. you describe um, where you actually do the authoring for your sales, that you're testing for your sales, and the relationship between those tools and the different environments that you have? Um, the sales testing tools um, are separate from, you know, our, our Unity. You know, we, we, we're a Unity shop, so we do a lot of our builds and everything in Unity. Um, the sales testing tools are a standalone. Um, that then feed, you know, take the output from that, and that feeds into, you know, the, that feeds into the build pipeline. Um, that's actually been one of the challenges because one of the things that we want people to be able to do is say, set this test up and then do a quick run and look at it on device before you actually sub do a final submit. So that's something that with the new tool, we're still looking at how can we make sure that we're improving that so that we've got better um, ability to look at those things up front. Um, but these are all proprietary tools that we're building at this point. Right, but you're authoring in a staging environment? Yes. 
and then you're pushing forward to production. Yes, yes, it goes, there's a staging environment, then it goes to the QA environment, and then QA actually will push it to the prod environment. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't understand. No, no, that's okay, it's okay. Do we have more questions? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, your sprinting is pretty complex, and I was curious, how did you arrive to that solution? Um, it looks complicated, I think, because we broke it down into really small bits because we wanted everyone to understand like all the pieces they needed to go through. Um, and because up to that point, um, it was pretty clear that we weren't doing a good job on, um, you know, is the spec written well? Is the spec clear? Does everyone understand what's in it? They actually then understand how to build it. Um, some of those things under, you know, like I said, when we start speeding these things up, rather than these things taking, you know, weeks, you know, I'd like to get them where the entire, that entire three week process kind of collapses down to, an, you know, just a week. Um, but that process, what we found is that at, that actually helps, like making sure that there's a spec that everyone has looked at and really understands and has a chance to hammer on so that they really understand what they're building is really important because part of what we want to get to is where, um, you know, these are not things that are handed down from on high. You want like the designers and the product managers to start saying, this is the experience I want to build. And you want like the artists and the engineers and other people like weighing in and saying, Here's the w here are the best ways to get there. And then when you've decided on that, then you know what you're building and then you can actually go through. The one added feature in here I think that's a little different is we have that thing that's called a QA breakdown. Um, one thing that we have found is that if our, we want our QA test team to also understand like what's going to be coming to them and have them both brainstorm around it because we found that's actually been really valuable for them letting um, engineering especially know like, hey, this is, <laughs> this is how we're going to test you for like, are there any weird edge cases? Like you should actually be thinking about that now when you're building it before it actually hits QA. Um, it's kind of a weird step, but we've actually found that it actually has value for the team. So one of the, the things that's important to me is not being super um, dogmatic about, um, you know, Agile says don't do that. It's like the process that works for your team is the process you should use. And if the process is not working for your team, get rid of it. So right now this is working for us. And as long as it's working and the team feels it's valuable, we'll keep doing it. And if at some point people feel like it starts becoming uh, restrictive, we'll take a look at changing it. Thanks. Hey, thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if you've ever um, thought about cutting back on features in order to make release dates? Yes. And how do you make that determination to extend a release date versus keep it and cut features? That's a really tough one. Um, one of the things that we're actually talking about in terms of like our ability to speed up releases is, um, yeah, do we want to actually cut down on features? Um, what happens now is we get a long list of, um, basically it's a, you know, they, it's a long wish list you know, from design and tech and player love and everybody else. Um, and during this whole like spec review process, we'll basically start calling things out. We actually don't, we realize now we don't have time to do these things. So the stuff that's at the bottom of the list goes away. One of the things that I would actually like to do is say like we now have a much, much better idea because we have this year's history of what kinds of things are easy to do and which things take more time. Um, what I'd actually like to be able to start doing is saying the things that we know that actually have um, a good return on investment and that are predict very, very predictable like our content releases are very predictable. Um, being able to look at those and saying, we also know how long, how long those now take, we've proven it. Um, and so that's something where we may even just pull that out and say, this is something that we're gonna do on a five week beat. And then these more complex features, we can start splitting some of the feature teams up and saying, you're gonna be doing this on a 12 week beat, you're gonna be doing this on an 18 week beat, but as far as the player is concerned, they're still getting stuff on a very regular basis. Um, and I think that's one thing that will help us figure out um, how much content do we, you know, how much content, how much features do we actually need to push out. Um, I think another thing that we're going to be taking a hard look at this year is 
um, what are the metrics that we want to start putting against the different types of features? So there's a number of things that sound great, but when you actually break them out in terms of it costs this much to build it in terms of player time and there's this much revenue or you know, retention or there's some metric committed against it, you know, how do those things line up? Um, and start calling things out where it's like it sounds good, but you haven't really proven that there's enough value there to do it. I think those are going to be some very tough conversations.